This issue of Zeke Magazine, our 11th, was conceived nearly a year ago to focus on photographers from Africa. And the first step was to find a partner, a guest editor, who had their pulse on the photography community on the continent. We're very fortunate to be introduced to Legetho McCullough, and after some brief discussions, it was clear that he was the right person to do this. And before I turn this over to Legetho, I would just like to say that this issue of Zeke Magazine is available by subscription as an individual copy or as a digital version. And you can find more about that on our website at zekemagazine.com. Now let me turn this over to Legetho McCullough to talk about how he realized the concept for the Africa issue of Zeke. Legetho? Uh, thank you, thank you, Glenn. Um, greetings to everybody. Thanks for making time to come and listen to us. Um, today is, is a day for the photographers. Um, I was just a conduite, um, trying to kind of facilitate uh, bringing out the practice um, out of Africa to the world. And I'm really thankful and grateful for, for, for Zeke Magazine to have uh, thought of us. And I think I'm representing the Market Photo Workshop, which is uh, a school for photography, um, the oldest um, school for photography in our region. And it has uh, produced um, some of the amazing photographers that, are, that, that have gone out to really uh, impact perceptions. And um, when, when, when Glenn approached me uh, to guest edit, uh, focusing on Africa, um, it was a daunting task uh, because um, Africa has always been seen as this singular uh, space, uh, one single big country. Um, forgetting that it's a country of, of, of many countries, over 50 countries, but also there is uh, some historic challenges in terms of the territories and regions of the continent, which are subdivided into the uh, north, um, east, west, central, and south, uh, some in, in, in a kind of a colonial, uh, 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 direct colonial links to the regions and divisions. And they, over time, there's, all this, there's been kind of these walls that we have been built, uh, social political walls that have been, they've been built that uh, did not allow the continent to interact um, fluidly as it's supposed to. So uh, when one thinks about photography in Africa, uh, one has to be really sensitive and also careful in terms of classifying as, as one single practice across the continent. Um, the continent experienced um, different milestones in terms of the post-colonial independence or independence of countries from colonial uh, 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 countries uh, since the 1960s. And that meant that the, the evolution or introduction of a photography as a practice among the people um, gradually grew in different um, uh, eras and, 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 and decades. As such, you wouldn't find a kind of a homogeneous one single way of photographing in Africa. South Africa is quite particular in terms of its uh, uh, institutions uh, that support the growth, uh, also allowance of independence, of, of freedom of, of, of photographing and the photography practice in South Africa. But certain parts of the country, of the continent, don't have those luxuries of, of uh, uh, to photograph, especially one when you when you when you speak about social documentary, uh, which again is another term that might not be familiar in many circles within the continent. Um, when you think about photographing day, daily lives of people as a photographer working in the streets and photographing there are certain parts of of, of countries um, because of of uh, political reasons or cultural religious reasons one is not allowed to, to photograph so those challenges exist and they have impacted negatively um, on the practice over the many years i would say over the past uh, 40 40 to 50 years uh, but recently uh, we've started seeing especially in the last uh, 20 years or so with the um, more both of vocal, young people becoming vocal in, in the general politics of their countries um, from the Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring in North Africa, but also some sub-Sahara uh, regions where we started seeing young people beginning to, to, to take uh, public space in voicing their concerns about the challenges they face within their, their countries. And that also led to um, other mediums being uh, used by these young people to express um, their, their concerns and photography is one of those. And I think um, with this kind of growth of young people and their voices and also introduction of, of technology, we started seeing the, the breakdown of these original uh, walls that had been there for, 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 for decades, if not centuries, where 
young people are beginning to interact with each other uh, to share their experiences, to share the work that they're doing. In such, you're starting to see a little bit of a, a style of photography growing and people becoming much more aware about their time, their space, the politics of their societies, their immediate communities, their own identities in relation to the histories of those spaces, but also their aspiration for the future. And I think you're starting to see that in the submissions that um, came through in this particular Zeke magazine, um, where you know, we start to see people that are really, really pushing the boundaries in terms of thought, in terms of confronting the established norms of society and culture, and also beginning to define uh, what should be for future. So when the call went out, I mean, we, we, we do understand that the practice is still kind of growing in Africa and, 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 and financially photographers have to still fund their own programs. So it's also difficult to find photographers that, that sustain themselves through documentary projects that are long-term. Uh, long-term project can be expensive. It means that you have to have some kind of funding to support yourself throughout a, a certain uh, a period of time to produce a certain type of work. And we knew very well that it's going to be difficult to find complete work that should be submitted. But I was so excited and happy to begin to see uh, beautifully uh, uh, I think chosen programs, uh, projects uh, thought through, and you can see a level of ethical kind of thinking in the works themselves, respect to the people that have been photographed or spaces that have been photographed, but also beginning to, you know, define the regions of the continent in a very, very particular way. And there's a certain common kind of uh, line in all of them where issues of where we come from and where we are, where we're going, are quite prevalent, um, but also the styles are quite varied. Um, and it shows that people are beginning to think and, and innovatively about, about the practice and about photography and within the context of, of the continent. So I think overall, I, I got a sense that we have a beautiful future in terms of, of the, the social documentary practice within the continent. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and the photographers will speak for themselves. All right, thank you. Thank you, Agatho. Um, if people have questions, let's hold all the questions off until the end, until after um, all six photographers have had a chance to present their work and talk about it. Um, I'd like to now present the portfolios in this issue of Zeke um, and ask each photographer who's here with us today to talk briefly about their project. And I'm going to share my screen to show the digital version of uh, this issue. And hopefully everybody is uh, seeing this now. This is an edited version of the magazine for this presentation, just to let you know. And the cover of Zeke is by Leanne Obaka, and she'll talk more about this in a few minutes. But I'd like to congratulate Leanne for winning second place in the World Press Photo Competition for this image in the category of portrait singles. Um, the first portfolio in Zeke magazine is by uh, photographer Hamilton Nevis. Uh, the title is Godmothers of War. And Hamilton is from Mozambique. He's not able to be with us today, so I'm just going to scroll through these images um, to give you a sense of the work. But what, the, what this project is about are women in Mozambique who sided with the Port Portuguese colonial colonialists during the war for independence. Um, and when the war was over, um, they were clearly shunned by the rest of the society. And he's done these portraits um, about these women and the difficulties they've experienced since. Let's see, I'm seeing a white page here. Are other people seeing a white page? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think I may need to relaunch this um, document. Give me a second here, please.
All right, so this is the work by Hamilton Nettles. The next project is by Amina Kadus from Cairo, Egypt, where she explores the abundance of iconic portraits of political figures in places of businesses throughout Cairo. I'll show the first, um, I'll show the images first and then ask Amina to talk about this project in greater detail. So let me just scroll through the images. Go back to the beginning. Okay, Amina, why don't you uh, talk to us a bit about this project? Okay, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amina, and I'm from Cairo. I'm based in Egypt. Uh, so this project um, is titled City Entrapped. I was mainly focusing on political icons and also religious icons um, that are being sanctified and idolized in parts of old Cairo. This is why the project is called City and Trap because it's like old Cairo is so much different than any other parts of the larger city. So it's kind of entrapped in its own past. And so people there are still reminiscing about old times and um, political figures that don't really exist anymore now. And they're kind of trapped in a, in a time zone where they don't really accept the present and don't want to kind of acknowledge the moment they're living now. So um, this, um, those photos I've taken on um, several encounters in the streets. Um, so I usually like to go every Saturday morning, uh, walk and, and just like do a, do a walk every, um, every week with a group of photographers. And so I've gathered those images across two years. And I've been, I'm actually still gathering more because I think it's an ongoing project that every time I I just plan to like just walk and roam and explore. I find even more more people kind of stuck in the past. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this project was I kind of felt um, I kind of there was a certain connection between me and this project in a way that I'm also still kind of trapped in my own past. Um, so part of um, part of the exploration of the project was kind of seeing certain traditions that are also rooted within us. And one of the main, main traditions is basically glorifying public icons and el elderly figures. So if it wasn't a political icon, usually you would find a certain, a significant other that is um, sanctified in one of the houses. And um, so, yeah, so I think this project kind of really talked about something that was in me, as well as something that was in public and a universal thought among um, in, in like in old Cairo. Um, it was also talking about how change is inevitable anyways, but in, in those neighborhoods, it was kind of constant. Constant is the change. And so, and, and the only thing that is constant are those icons. So um, in those photographs, you would see Abdel Nasser, which was a very famous um, um, political icon that kind of had his own movement and people would follow him. Um, he was, um, he did his, his Nasser um, movement and he kind of really rallied for, for the working class. Um, and so that's why I, I mainly saw his portraits in workshops and in artisan, um, um, artisan spaces in old Cairo. Um, you would also see, it was very interesting for me to encounter King Farouk's portrait. King Farouk was the, was the overthrown king um, before Nasser did the 1952 revolution, the, the coup d'etat, and um, it, was, it was something so unexpected because usually like in those areas, people are just so pro Nasser. And so um, there was, this was like the, uh, Glenn, if you move forward with the images, Yeah, the one after. This one or the next one? The next one, yeah, this one. So um, this was, no, the one before, sorry. Yeah, so, so this was um, in one of the workshops just 
walking down the street in a neighborhood. And um, when I saw this picture, I just ran in. I was like, I was really surprised. And, and it was interesting to see that one of the, one of the workers there, um, he's like, he's, he's really talking about the time of King Feru and how he wants to go back to, to those times and how it's, how it's, um, he really doesn't see any, any sort of, um, he feels kind of alienated in the time, in, in, in his own presence. So um, I kind of felt similar to him because I'm still also stuck in that time era. Um, and I'm kind of like taking those personal narratives forward. Um, so yeah, so it's, it was very interesting for me to explore those neighborhoods and just come across those icons and see how they're rooted so much in our traditions. And, and kind of, um, it's not only in old Cairo, but like in, in a lot of places in, in Egypt, but mainly just stuck in, 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 a, in, a, small, in a small area where people are just so entrapped and, and they kind of don't really recognize what's happening or that life is really happening outside, but they, they can't cope with it. So yeah, this is, um, this is partly it. All right, well, thank you. And again, we'll have um, opportunity for questions later. Move on to the next portfolio. All right, next we have this portfolio titled Among You by Mohamed Kalito from Morocco. And this project is about the choice of personal identity for youth in Morocco. So Mohamed, uh, why don't you talk to us a bit about this project? Actually, let me scroll through the images first, I'm sorry. Okay, Mohammed. Hello everyone, my name is Mohamed Kilito. I'm a, I'm a photographer from Rabat, Morocco. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this video conference. Uh, so this is a project called Among You, which is the first chapter of a project dedicated to Moroccan youth. Uh, the idea of working on the project comes from two different uh, uh, observations. So the first one was to compare how, as a young, uh, young Moroccan, a uh, guy from Rabat, I di didn't used to see people dressed in a very extravagant way. Uh, we also didn't used to talk a lot about people that have uh, different kind of uh, sexual orientations and uh, people that also have creative processes that in a certain way confront uh, the traditional norms of the Moroccan society. And then I was reading one day uh, a magazine and I stumbled upon a report made by the Environmental uh, Social Economical Council about Moroccan youth between 15 and 24 years old. And the numbers and the, st the statistics that were uh, presented in the report were so alarming that I decided that I would like to understand what is being uh, uh, Moroccan youth today in Morocco. What are the realities? What are the, uh, the frustration those people have? So the first chapter I decided to work on is on personal identity. And I started to talk about people that I know and also look on the med uh, social medias about profiles that are un uncommon. And uh, I, at, the, at the beginning, I, I had this thought of young generations today are a bit lost with social media and so many superficial and shiny things around us. And I was so impressed about how these young youth that I have met were so uh, eloquent and had their discourse so referenced. They know what they're doing, they know what they're doing that. And I, I was uh, appealed about how they are confronting society norms in a way that they, they want to show how other changing and how different uh, Morocco is today. So for example, the image we're seeing uh, now, this, this uh, girl is called Selma. She's coming from, uh, from a middle-class uh, family, from a popular neighborhood, and she, she's goat. She likes things that are not attractive for normal people. Uh, I don't know what is normality. But on the other image next to it, in the diptych, I'm also showing uh, ideal of, uh, of beauty 
from the other generation. So basically, in each diptych, each image that is next to the portrait uh, resonates somehow with the, with the picture I have taken. And uh, what else can I say? Uh, so this is the first chapter of project. I'm working on other projects. The idea is to work on a book. For me, it is very important to work on the narratives, the visual narratives, in, in a way to work with rhythms and to tell a story. Uh, that's it. I don't know what I can add, Glenn. Well, well, can you just talk a bit more about maybe one of these subjects, um, perhaps this young girl? Yeah, Randa. So Randa is a girl I met in Tetuan. Tetuan is a very conservative city in northern Morocco. Uh, I was talking to a friend and asking her if she, she knows anyone that had very uh, unparticular profiles. And she told me about this girl that lives in Tetuan. So I contacted her through Instagram. Uh, we spoke briefly. I explained to her the, the project I'm working on. She was excited about it. I went to meet her and then we took these pictures. And what is very important about this project that I have to mention, I think that sh taking these pictures, showing these pictures in, uh, let's say, European or American capitals, in Paris or Barcelona or Madrid or New York, it is something that is quite common. We see those people all the time. But in Morocco, those people, we don't see them all the time. So, for example, when I show those pictures in Morocco, a lot of people ask me if those people are Moroccan. So, for me, it was important to show this, this, this kind of Morocco. Mm -hmm. Maybe it, should, it could be cliche for people that come from other capitals. But in Morocco, it's something that is quite unparticular. And uh, I wanted also to, to tell their stories. Uh, so she, she suffers, those people suffer. Being, being gay in Morocco, you can be jailed for, uh, for one year. Uh, kissing people on the streets, something you can do. Dr dressing in a particular way is somehow very difficult for those people because they get uh, bullied, they get uh, sexually harassed. And this is the story of the majority of those people I photograph. It's not easy to have the courage to embrace your identity. So this girl, for example, dresses differently, puts makeup, gets herself and goes in the streets uh, of Tetuan, and it is a struggle, an everyday struggle she lives. So for me, it was interest, important for me to state and tell their stories, uh, and also I'm confronting these stories with other stories. For example, the next, next uh, sub-project I'm working on is on Morocco, uh, Moroccan uh, rural youth. So it's another, another reality. So I'm working on different microcosms, and this one is the first one I, uh, I will was working on and it's still a work in progress. I'm still working on, on it at the moment. Okay, thank you. Really powerful work, really extraordinary portraits. Thank you. Okay, the next project is titled Unsettled by Sadel Willa Smith in South Africa, exploring white South African histories, privileges, and reflections on identity. And I'll scroll through, through the pictures, and then Sadell will tell us a bit more about them. If people have a chance to look at the this issue of Zeke, the text on, on these are very powerful. Okay, Sadell. Hi everyone, thanks so much for this opportunity to present the work in this format. Um, this is a project that I've been working on for about the last five years um, intermittently. I'm a documentary photographer, but I also run a non-profit solar cinema project. So I'm very focused on media advocacy impact campaigns in my day-to-day -day work. So this project stems out of a similar passion and interest. Um, I have a background in anthropology and through the years studying the relationship between anthropology, ethnography and colonial photography, I became more and more interested in this idea that white South Africans, white Africans had not necessarily been documented and gazed upon in the same ways that other people on the African continent had been that were so exploitative and um, problematic in the past and other other so for me there was this sense that I wanted to confront that and get my fellow white South Africans to engage with the concept of what benefits they had gained from apartheid and the history of colonialism in the country and on the continent. 
and really get a sense from them about how they navigate their identity with that history and with the present day realities that that history has afforded. So it was a participatory project. It was very much around interviewing people, doing lengthy interviews with a variety of um, middle class people, lower income people, different genders, different cultural backgrounds. So it was quite a broad approach, but I guess in the approach there was quite a research focus to it of trying to get as broad a sample of people as possible. So I used Facebook, word of mouth, friends, different kinds of um, identifying groups. And through that, I interviewed around 40 different white South Africans. And then I also just went to spaces that are fre frequented by majority white people um, and took photographs. And as a white South African, it's very easy for me to blend in into those situations and not, not be questioned as to why am I doing this project and what the premise of the project was for. So it was a very interesting approach for me in terms of the power dynamic of that um, and the reactions that the project has received have been quite mixed. It's gone on to be exhibited publicly in South Africa pre-COVID in a very prominent, busy public park in the center of Cape Town, and it was defaced when it was placed in a public arena. So it's definitely sparked different kinds of engagements. But what I appreciate about doing the process was realizing this need for more and more of these kinds of platforms for people to talk about these difficult issues relating to the history of apartheid, the history of colonialism, and really get people to reflect on their settler identity and what that has afforded them. So it's an ongoing work. It's probably something that I will carry on doing for the rest of my life. Um, I see it being a book. I would like to do a chapter of it in America. I'd like to do a chapter of it in Canada, possibly New Zealand and Australia one day, and really trace those roots of what whiteness has afforded people and this idea of explorers and conquerors and pioneers and what that has let what scars that's left behind. So it's it's definitely my my biggest long term documentary baby. So I'm very grateful to have it featured in this particular edition of Zeke. And like what we just did with Mohammed, maybe if you could just talk about uh, one of these subjects and what they're talking about here. I realize uh, we can't read the text. Um, do you have the text with you, Sibel? Or um, I can get it. I can. I can tell you what it. I mean, I know them. Right, I know so them well. So. <laughs> Yeah, so why don't you so, one of these subjects and tell us a bit about them? Maybe I should just I should talk about the one to the right, the man in the traditional attire. Sure. Because that sparks that sparks a lot of interest from a diversity of people. So this man is a white South African of English heritage who is training to be a Sangoma, a traditional leader. So he's in the phase of becoming a Sangoma, which is called being a Twasa. He lives in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, which is the Kosa traditional homeland area. It is a place of great deep spirituality um, linked to ancestors. And this man feels that based on his calling that he has received from the spirits, that the best route for him to follow in his spiritual practice is to become a Sangoma. So... On one hand, visually, on a, on a first level, one could say that it, you know, it reads very much like cultural appropriation and what right does this man to have to this heritage? And that has been the response from many people who've seen the work publicly. But on the other, there's layers to it in the fact that in his, even in his outfits, he is wearing components of his Scottish heritage. You can see the kilt material at the top of the Twasa traditional skirt. Um, and he runs a sustainably owned ecotourism lodge in a community. Um, he speaks the language. You know, there's all these other layers to it. So for me, I think that in South Africa, things are not necessarily as they seem um, on a surface level. And it is very complex as how people navigate their identity markers in this country with its very fascinating history. So I was very... Um, keen to have somebody like him included in the project. As I said, I tried to include as many diverse people as possible. Okay, well, thank you. Is 
The next portfolio is titled Other Worlds by Musa Kalapa from Mali. Uh, this project is a story about Saba, a Malian national who carries multiple untold and self-imposed expectations, as well as his um, perspectives and quests for entering into another world, imagined or real. Musa is not able to be with us today because of travel restrictions imposed by the coronavirus. Unfortunately, he's stuck in France with, without access to the internet other than his cell phone. Um, but let me just go through some of these incredible images by him. The caption here says the place where Saba works to survive. And this is the identity card Saba has had for 10 years. All right, the next project is Soweto Punk by South African photographer Riora Rejaneri. Um, in Soweto, young musicians are creating a new South African punk scene, spearheaded by the group TCIYF. And if you'd like to know what that means, you can look in Zeke magazine. In a country where so little economic opportunities are offered to black youth, punk and skateboarding are keys to what they consider the most precious gift of all, to be free. Let me just scroll through these few images of the punk scene in Soweto. And technically these are very difficult images because of the shadows, but uh, Riari did a remarkable job maintaining this uh, information in the shadows. And if you ever get a chance to see the printed magazine, the printer did a remarkable job as well. Okay, Miara, why don't you talk to us a bit about this project? Are you there? Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor to be part of this edition of the magazine. Uh, so I'm a photographer from Madagascar, and I've been living in South Africa for eight years now. And um, arriving in South Africa for me was a uh, kind of a revelation because I'm Madagascar where race is very taboo conversation and here you know it's very open uh, everyone talks about it on a daily basis so um, it really opened my eyes um, and had me uh, think very deeply about uh, race and identity uh, my identity and uh, the African identity is general and um, since the very beginning when I started I really wanted to um, show a different aspect of Africa rather than the poverty, disease, war, etc. And I thought it was very important for me to show it because I for myself never um, saw myself in what the media depicted in general about Africa. So I really wanted to show something different and it was for me, important for me to show people who didn't fit in any boxes that was shown in the traditional media. And, uh, and then I found these people whom I found very interesting because um, punk was introduced in South Africa in the late 70s or early 80s, and it was mainly um, part of the white culture in uh, uh, apartheid South Africa. And then um, uh, when South Africa ended the apartheid, um, you know, the music and the culture made their way somehow in the township. And these young people are incredible because um, they started skateboarding, you know, in 2011. They started bonding around skateboarding. And then they listened to the music, uh, maybe hanging out with um, white people. And they decided to um, take the culture and bring it to the, um, to the township and organize these crazy events uh, in the township of, of Soweto, where um, many people come, but really they have no idea the first time they are going there, what they are listening to, because you know, they, they, they have never heard the music before. So it's, um, so, they are, so mo 
a great part of the audience is there by curiosity, um, but then they, they become addicted because it's, it's a very different thing, it's a very different vibe. And, and I got very um, fascinated by these people who decided not to be put in a box and just, you know, live their, their own thing and not impose, but share it to the, um, uh, to the community. Uh, so I followed this guy uh, for, um, for a few months, actually. I followed them, went to their event, like a groupie. And, um, and uh, yes, that's, um, that's, what, yeah, that's, that's what happened. And that was the, the purpose of the, um, the, um, the project. What about this first photo? Can you tell us something about the people who are the guitar player here? Yes, actually, in this, uh, this is Tusi. And uh, in, the, in, this, um, in this picture, actually, they are playing in, um, they are not playing in Soweto, they are playing in a white suburb in Johannesburg. And that's all the more fascinating because, you know, now they, are, they, they play in front of white audiences in white neighborhoods. So they are not only taking the, um, the, the picture, the, the culture in Soweto, but they are also um, uh, playing in front of uh, white audiences in what neighborhood, which is quite remarkable, and um, and yeah, they they uh, that's 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 what they do. So they are they are playing in Melville, which is in Johannesburg, and uh, yes. All right. Well, thank you. And moving on here. Uh, the next project is by Omaregi Asak Polar from Nigeria um, with his project Forgotten Nation, exploring a pension system in Nigeria that is corrupt and leaves many elderly people without the benefits that they were promised and deserve. Now, Omaregi was supposed to be with us today. He's trying to be with us, but he's having internet problems in Nigeria, and it doesn't look like he was able to make it on the call. I'm here, I'm here. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> um, terrific then. So I'm, I'm glad you're here. Let me scroll through uh, these pictures first. And I, I see your Zoom name is HP. I, I didn't recognize that. I think that's the problem. Okay, Omaregi, why don't you talk to us a bit about these incredible portraits? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Gudins from Lagos, Nigeria. My name is um, Omaregi Osakolo. I'm a documentary photographer and filmmaker from Nigeria. The, this work is tied to the Mission Forgotten. It's an ongoing uh, multimedia project. Uh, like, like Glenn said, it's about... Uh, Nigerian pensioners. The work started, I started the project in 2016. Um, that was just few, few, um, a year after, I, two years after I left university. So uh, I started the project with my father, who was the, the first portrait here. In Nigeria, it is a common thing for uh, someone to work, like government workers then to work retired and not get paid their gratuities or pension allowances. Like, so I, I started a project with my father because I wanted to add my voice to the struggle of uh, these senior citizens. You know, the, the government borrows some huge amount of money from pension funds. They never get to put back and it affects the, this, this, this old people. I started seeing, um, it's off, 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 off when you see these people protesting on the streets and on TV and all that. I felt the pension situation is, is actually uh, is one of the reasons why there's so much corruption in the public service in Nigeria. Because in my opinion, these people are actually currently working when they see how they'll be treated in the future. So they won't actually do all they can right now 
to, to, to amass a lot of money. So when they retire, they don't get to actually face this. And it's actually one of the reasons why young people in Nigeria, for instance, don't want to work in the, in the public service. You know, so I started the project to add my voice to the struggle of, of, of these people. Nigeria is a very complex country politically. So I started with my father, and after a while, I decided to travel around the, the country, to travel around, all, around the country and see, uh, to make uh, this portrait of about 100 pensioners. It is an ongoing project, and I'm currently working on the film, which will be released later this year. And the project, so next to, to I, I want to actually make the project an, an, an intervention of some sort. So why, uh, uh, I want to use it as a form of advocacy for, for these people and give them a voice through uh, the images and through the film. And hopefully in the, in the, in the future, which is going to be the, the, the third aspect of the project, I would um, put it in the book. And after that, have a traveling exhibition where I'll take it around different parts of the country. And of course, the film too, um, hoping, hopefully when it's released later in the year, I'll have it screened at, uh, at, at, at the National Assembly and have these people and have us uh, 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 start talking about this issue because it is actually like a major contribution to why there is so much corruption in the public service. So this is what I, I, I tend to, to do with the work. Um, these are remarkable portraits. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about one of these subjects? Um, how about this woman um, in the last of your uh, photographs in Zeke magazine? Can you talk a bit about who she is and what her problems are with the pension system? Okay. <clears throat> I photographed her sometimes in 2000 and, uh, 2018, rather. Yeah, she was, she's a retired teacher. She taught, uh, in the eastern part of Nigeria. And after, of course, when she retired, she, up to the time I photographed her, the government of, of, of that particular region uh, have, as an, as, as an opinion, a, a gratuity, a, a gratuity and a monthly pension allowances. And sometimes in 2016, the government of, the, of that same region actually decided to pay pensioners and he said he was going to pay them on, on the ground that they would forfeit uh, about 60% of the total money the government was owing them. If, for instance, you've been owed for the past five or six or ten years, you are only allowed, only entitled to 40% of that money. You know, the protest, the, the, this, so, so she's among those people that were affected by that, that policy. And they protested that the government had to actually force some of them to sign the paper and, 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 and take that 40% of, that, of, of, of their, their arrears. So she was actually like one of those pensioners who, 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 who suffered from such things and is still suffering from it. Because the last time I spoke with her, she said uh, gratuity still has not been paid. And the first portrait there is my... This one? Yeah, this is my father who inspired the, the project. I've been making images of him and I decided to take it out to look for other stories because the story might be, they might, they might all have a collective um, um, story in being that they're all pensioners suffering from non-payment of gratuities and monthly allowances. But sometimes there, there are some peculiar stories because the pensioners who couldn't get their, um, the gratuity before dying. You know, there's some cases that cases like that. I photographed one of them though. The image is not right here. So he start, I started the project with him. He's part of the project. He's a retired uh, customer officer, retired in 20, 2007. And I, I, as I talk to you right now, only about, um, about 70% of his gratuity has been paid. He still be owned so much. And He's 73 now. He retired while he was still in his in his in his in his sixties. You know, so yeah, he's my father. All right. Well thank you. Thank you. I wish you well with this project and I, I wish these pensioners well in recuperating their full pension someday. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Okay, you're lucky. All right, last up is Leanne Ovaca and her project Black Drag Magic that tells the stories of black, queer, gender non-conforming, and trans bodies in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, Leanne, and again, congratulations again for winning the award from World Press Photo for the cover image. So can you tell us a bit more about this project? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Leanne Orbach, and I'm a visual storyteller from South Africa. I'm really excited to be here with you tonight as we find new ways of being together in these strange times. First of all, I'd like to say a very big thank you to Glenn and Lechetto for putting together such a beautiful edition of the magazine and for using this platform to highlight work from African photographers. I feel incredibly honored to be featured in the magazine amongst so many phenomenal photographers whose work I really admire. So I'd love to tell you a bit more about myself and my work. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, my work is all about identity, collaboration and celebration. I'm interested in using the medium of photography as a mode of celebration and co-creation. And as a photographer, I'm really interested in holding space for my subjects where they can play an active part in the co-creation of images. They really feel tell these stories in a way that is affirming and celebratory. The project hashtag Black Drag Magic is a collaboration between myself, Belinda Kakamba Kafasi and the subjects of the series. And you can see Belinda's image featured on the cover of the magazine, which is something we're incredibly excited about. So the project tells the stories of black, queer, gender non-conforming and transgender people who navigate their daily lives in the townships in Cape Town. The project is about augmenting the power in these stories of daily township spatial navigation. With this work, we really wanted to create a platform of expression where we invited members of the LGBTQI plus community to come and co-create images. They really felt told their stories in a way that is affirming and celebratory. The project was shot in Kailitsha, a partially informal township located in the city of Cape Town. The name is Koza for our new home. And for the subjects of the series, the township is home. But in reality, it is also a space where they are subjected to violence and discrimination on a daily basis as they move within public spaces, community spaces, and even at home. As a group, we really wanted to stand up against the overwhelming climate of discrimination and reclaim the township. And we wanted to send a very clear message that these spaces need to be safe spaces. The process of creating the project thus became a radical and progressive act of activism to really stand up against the overwhelming climate of discrimination and to send this very clear message. The setting was also chosen to celebrate the lesser known township drag scene. Um, the art form of drag has become westernized and South African drag queens have often felt pressure to assimilate to these western standards of drag. There's therefore a need to celebrate African drag as an art form that tells stories. The one thing that, or a couple of things that really stood out to me when I was first introduced to the township drag scene as opposed to other drag spaces within the city was just the very unapologetic nature of it and really this claiming of our unique South African culture and identity and celebrating that. We don't need more Beyonce's, we really need to celebrate our unique South African culture. So this was something that really excited me. Another thing that was really important to the group to explore with the work was the role that cultural identity plays within black queer identity. It's impossible to separate your causa identity from your queer identity, and in doing so, you're invalidating your full existence. One of the very interesting conversations we initially had was the role language plays and how in many indigenous languages, there really aren't any words to describe being gay or being a transgender man or woman. This is very problematic when you want to come out to your family who don't necessarily speak any English. It also really reinforces this very problematic idea that homosexuality is perceived as being un-African. To be given access to someone's world and someone's story is an incredible privilege and I'm so grateful to Belinda and everyone I worked with on this project for trusting me to tell these stories. And I really hope that 
my work is a fantastic celebration of the phenomenal people I get to work with. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, before we go into the question and answer session, um, let me stop sharing this for now. Um, I'd just like to say that we've gone through the photographers in Zeke magazine, but there's a lot of other content that I just want to recognize. Um, there's a very in-depth article in the magazine titled Africa's Visual Vernacular by Uche Akpa Oroha from uh, Lagos, Nigeria. And he heads the Lele Institute there, it's a photography institute there. Um, there's also an article called Documenting Freedom and Struggle by Pelodi Sanang from South Africa. Um, there's an interview with Joanna Chamali from Cote d'Ivoire, a photographer and visual artist. And last, I'd just like to give a shout out to Lou Jones um, here from the Boston area, who's featured in Zeke for a project that he's been working on for um, nearly five years called the Pan Africa Project. And Lou has set out to photograph and document every country in Africa. Um, and in the past five years, he's just made a dent, but he, he hopes to be able to um, complete this project. And um, his goal is to show Africa from um, a positive perspective, not to show the problems and difficulties that we tend to be more familiar with, but how people are making headway in um, economic sphere, industry, uh, culture, education. Um, so let's go into the um, Q&A session now. And if anybody would like to ask a question, um, please raise your hand. To do that, um, go into the participant button at the bottom of your screen, and it'll bring up a window, and there should be a button there that says, um, raise your hand. And I'll call on people in the order um, that I see the hands pop up. So I, I see one hand pop up by Sally Chapman. So Sally, can, can you unmute yourself um, and say okay. where you're from? Hi, Glenn, and uh, thank you for everything. This is, I live in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, and um, you know it's a wonderful presentation, a great issue of the magazine. And I have a question for uh, Leanne. Um, in a number of the images, the, the, the people are holding an object. I mean, at first I thought it was a microphone, but it looks like it's probably more of a traditional object. And, uh, can, Leanne, can you talk about what that is and what the relationship is? Sure. Hi, Sally. Very good question. Um, so one of the very important things that the subjects also wanted to do was this reclaiming of cultural identity. So it's a traditional object that is usually used by Kosa women for traditional ceremonies like weddings. And so it was important for them to use these objects and to say, just because I am gay or I'm a transgender woman, this is my culture too. And it's okay for me to use these objects that are usually used in these traditional spaces and only reserved for women. I'm glad you asked that question because I had the same question and I wasn't sure um, what yeah. these things were. They do look like a microphone, but obviously they're not. All right, the next question is by Uday. Uh, unmute yourself and um, tell us where you're zooming from, Uday. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, this is Uday. Um, I'm right now in Westboro, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, first of all, thanks, Glenn, for organizing this. It's been a fantastic journey and a great issue uh, for Africa. Just wonderful images by really excellent photographers. Um, my question is for Sidel. Uh, I don't know if she's still there. Um, beautiful subject and story that you're showing. Uh, I know you mentioned that you, ha you were doing in-depth interviews with your subjects. Uh, could you share something uh, from those interviews, uh, you being yourself being white uh, in Africa? How does it, how does, what kind of stories surprise, surprised you when you were talking to people um, about this project? 
Hi, thank you. Very good question. Um, so the interviews that I did with people were about an hour, an hour and a half long, and I transcribed them and have been using them in public exhibitions. So if you, if you engage the work in a public space, there is a huge section of the aluminium board where key segments of the interview are included. And they're also included as audio excerpts um, in videos that I've made of the work. Um, the, the interviews were so diverse. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint an exact one, but I think there were many that were sadly not very surprising in terms of very embedded racist prejudicial um, views um, by certain people from particular backgrounds that I, in the interview space, it was difficult not to get personally upset and personally kind of want to attack and engage and, you know, debate. I really wanted to try and just capture their, their stories and their ways of why they think the way that they do. Also based on the desire to really put those views out into the world so that people can see these, that these issues are still there, that you can't just play this colorblind um, rainbow nation card that South, South Africa is so obsessed with race, but so many people want to use that argument and say, why can't we let go of the race issue? But then there are these people who still think like this, who still vote for particular parties, who still hold power, who still own land, who still do the same things they were doing under apartheid. So that was the reason for wanting to include them. Um, I think the most hopeful interviews, not to be cliche, but were with young people. Young people who, I'm 33, but younger people who are 16, who go to very mixed schools, who have um, a diversity of teachers, have people in their classes from all over Africa, have quite a different experience of South Africa than what I did growing up. Those people gave me a lot of hope. And one of them was a young woman, Eliza, whose mother is American and whose father is South African. And she was saying how, you know, if she was to leave South Africa, like so many people she sees immigrating now, she's 16 years old, and she was to go to America, the same issues would, she would be faced with the same issues there. The whiteness would follow her to that part of the world. There's nowhere that she can run to. She has to confront these issues. So the fact that someone so young can engage with a topic that's so complex like that with such humility and grace was very inspiring for me. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Um, we have a question from Sophia. Can you unmute yourself and say where you're from? Um, Sophia, I'll unmute you if you're not sure how to do that. Okay. Oh. All right. Perfect. I just unmuted myself. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophia. I'm originally from Morocco. I live in the United States. Um, I have a question for Mehmet. Um, the work that you're doing is crucial to the advancements of human rights in Morocco. And having grown up in Morocco, I know it takes abundance courage to give a voice to the wrongfully outlawed, disgraced, and vilified for being who they choose to be. Where did you get the courage to stand up uh, for the voiceless? What inspired you? Let's see, is Mohammed on? There you are, okay. I, I honestly think that the courageous people are the one I'm photographing because I'm only uh, I'm only there to be a bridge somehow between an audience and those people that live a very harsh reality sometimes here in Morocco. Because as I said when I was doing the presentation, uh, those issues in other countries, people have the freedom to be who they are. But here in Morocco, we are a Muslim country. Uh, some people don't accept a lot of things. So I, I, I was quite impressed about something actually lately that happened. Uh, there is a gay couple that doesn't show actually in the selection that uh, Legito and Glenn did for the Vic magazine, but there is a, a gay couple that are enlacing themselves, and this picture has been shown in the opening exhibition of the National Museum of Photography in Morocco. And I was quite impressed because when the picture was selected, I thought they, they have actually mistaken it with something else. They only thought that they were just friends. But I received... Uh, a correction on the text of this specific picture. And then I was quite amazed. And a journalist came to me and it, it, he told me this is the first time that a public institution 
dedicated to art in Morocco is showing something about, uh, about gay people. So for me, the courageous people, it's not me. It's those two young people because by, by being in the pictures, by allowing me to take their pictures, they are taking a risk, a risk of being in jail for a year in Morocco. So I think those people don't want to, to just uh, hide and be who they are, but they want to take the space, they want to talk, they want to confront the authorities, they want to be and tell to the people that we are here among you. And this is why actually I decided to, to, to take uh, a title for the series called Among You, because these two girls told me that they don't want to hide anymore. They want to talk, they want to express themselves, they want to fight for their rights, they want to take the space that they don't have at the moment. And this is very crucial for Moroccan youth today to say that they exist. And if the government is not giving them the, oppor or the opportunities to, to take the role they need to play, they will do it by themselves in so many different ways. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Sophia. Right, we have a question from Sibylla Smith. Sib? And unmute yourself. Hi. Um, thank you, Glenn. Um, I'm very, very interested in the topic, and I think that the, um, the array of images and issues that you were able to put into one uh, magazine reflecting so many countries is very, very impressive. Um, and I am struck by a few things. One is I have been working um, on a body of work by a... Um, a uh, queer black photographer on LGBTQ issues for uh, basically uh, his uh, ability to try to own all of his identities and to follow that track. So I've been thinking a lot about layers of these issues. So it's interesting that a few of the um, subject matters take on this uh, uh, work. And I actually, um, uh, I'm thinking of two things. One is what Lee Ann said about the um, ability for people to, um, how do they uh, bring together these separate identities? Like if you, if you embrace one that is queer and one that, and you are African, how do you work with that? And one woman in the book that Mikhail Awuna is uh, working on that, or that published, and this is an ongoing project called Limitless Africans, one of the um, non-binary people described uh, exactly what you said, Mohammed, which is acceptance would be being among you. So I'm struck by the title of your project because that for them is all they want is to be a part. So my question specific was to you, Mohammed, about the diptychs and about the portrait series and how much the people that you uh, photographed, how much they were a part of the process of their portrait of, of the placement, like did they pick where they wanted to be um, photographed? And I was curious about how you paired the images and perhaps why with certain, I, I mean, I can see aesthetically some things, but I was curious about your thought process. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sila, for your question. Uh, actually, uh, this is uh, this is the first time that I'm photographing this way because I'm usually doing more of more classical documentary kind of work. Uh, I first time I approached them, I realized that they were aware of a certain image they wanted to show. So I decided that I could take a picture in a kind of an editorial way, mm -hmm. and I started doing that. So I go to see them; they dress in a certain way, they're putting kind of makeup. And I decided to play the game. So I go to them and we are doing kind of editorial uh, photography. So this is because I wanted to respect also, they, they were happy actually when I contacted them because now I'm working on rural youth. Rural youth usually are a bit scared of me. They don't want me to photograph them. So there is a lot of more work to do in convincing them to be part of the project. But this rural youth from uh, urban uh, centers, they're actually very happy when I contact them. They're like, ah, oh, there is a professional photographer who's coming to take a picture of me. So they're very, 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 fascinated about that. So when I go to, to photograph them, they, uh, they are part of the process. And for me, it's quite in interesting to be, I don't see them as subject, but I see them as collaborators. And this is something quite important for me. The second question about the diptych, 
I wanted to, because as I said when I was doing the presentation, a lot of people ask me if those people are Moroccans, because they don't see them. They don't, you never see them in Morocco. And I decided to have a picture, a side of the portrait, to somehow, at the same time, that resonates in certain way the portrait, can tell the story of the portrait, but also is enabling us in a certain way to know that we are in, uh, in Morocco or in an Arab and Muslim country. Uh, I, I, I can't, can you, can we, Glenn, can we pick one of the pictures? Maybe I can uh, explain yeah. what's the connection between both of them. Is there one particular? One, whatever, whatever you want. This one. Mm, perfect. So this is this is Tilila. She suffers from uh, skin hyperpigmentation, mm -hmm. and she's a wonderful young woman. Very smart. Very courageous. Uh, she studied the linguistic, and I have these amazing talks with her about uh, sociology and uh, anthropology. She knows. Uh, she knows like so many things, and I was so fascinated about her. So because she had this skin hyperpigmentation. She suffered from bullying, from uh, sexual harassment, because she was different. Mm -hmm. And actually what she did, what I found very smart, is she started uh, putting her pictures on Instagram. And a lot of photographers and designers started working with her. She's now work, she's working with Yves Saint Laurent, she works with Louis Vuitton, she did this photographer from all over the world taking pictures of her. Mm -hmm. And I met her before all that happened. So basically what could be a weakness, she used it in a way that became her own signature, and she made a career out of that. I'm finding it quite, quite interesting. What I do with the door close to it, there is, there is actually, uh, like, the, the patterns on the door remind what, what she has on her face, but what is even more interesting for me is the, the locked door, because I'm actually the first one who tells the, her story. What does she have, Why, what's happening about her, because all the time she's only a face in the magazines, and it was important for me to show that it's locked and you have to open the lock to access something else be behind only the superficial and the aesthetical uh, uh, way she shows herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I must say the markings on this woman's face are quite beautiful. Um, are, are those all a result of her skin condition or are any of them applied separately? Well, this is, this is actually a question that was raised many times. Uh, when I interviewed her, she told me that she has skin hyperpigmentation, but there were a lot of people that were telling me that it's, she's putting henna on them and things like that. I'm not sure about what is the, the, the right answer to that. I am not, uh, I'm only doing a sociology work in taking the interviews. I'm not able to see what is behind the, the, the process. But some people tell me that it's not the case. Some people tell me it's the case. I, I'm, I'm uh, just holding on what she really told me because I don't know exactly what's the, what's the answer, to be honest with you, Glenn. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, we have a question by John Gallagher. Unmute yourself, John, and tell us where you're from. Hi, everyone. I'm from Arlington, Massachusetts, and I have a question from... Hamid, and you mentioned earlier that your subjects are the courageous ones for uh, exposing themselves to the camera. You know, they're, you're making the image. You're not the one who, whose presentation could be controversial. But um, are, are there galleries that would show your work in Morocco? Because then, you know, you could be, you know, subject to criticism or controversy yourself. I mean we're online and we're all relatively safe from our living rooms, but, you know, when things open up in their physical spaces where you can show pictures again, um, have you, or would you show these pictures? Is it possible in Morocco? Uh, this is uh, John, this is a very good question. Thank you very much. So for example, this, this uh, pictures has been shown in Sharjah Art Foundation, which is uh, one of the most important foundations in the United Arab Emirates. And, uh, I sent a selection of pictures where there is some gay people, for example, and it was, it was uh, uh, censored. So they chose a couple of pictures that they liked, but the, the pictures that were talking about uh, persons 
like uh, transgenders and, uh, and gay, they just remove them from the selection. I accept it because I know this is how the rules of the country are. Uh, in, uh, in Morocco, they, as I was saying earlier, in the National Gallery, they, they have actually shown the, the picture, which is public space. I'm sure that in Morocco I can show it in different galleries and, and it's quite an open, uh, open country to, to, to show uh, work that is confronting. Uh, we have some red lines that we can't cross as uh, the monarchy, as the territory of the country, which those things we can't touch to, uh, on. But for example, those pictures, I can show them in, in gallery, but I was impressed to show them in a national museum. This was for me quite shocking because I would just think that they will just remove them to avoid any, any, any polemics. I don't know if you answered your, your, uh, your question. Thank you. You're very welcome. And we have one more hand raised by Goya Kuss. Uh, Goya, can you unmute yourself? And tell us where you're from. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry, I don't have any um, my my cameras on the fritz right now. I am from northern United States in a small, but I have had the good fortune to have visited Cairo, and so I have a a question for Amina, um, uh, for her essay uh, or portraits that she made. Um, they, you said, mentioned something, and forgive me if I got it quite, if I didn't get it correctly, but that you relate to the man that um, had the image on the wall of the ruler prior to Nasser. And I was curious, um, you know, why, why is it that you relate to that image or that, that era? Um, and is there, I mean, I, I, I know that, that it, that, um, that part of old Cairo, um, at least I think I do, um, and I and I could envision those those small little workshops. Um, and and I'm curious whether the people who you photographed, you know, whether they were, whether you were able to have you know in depth conversations about all the different things that they missed, and if you have. So I, there are multiple questions here. Um, if you had places that you were able to show these locally and. What kind of effect do you want the work to have? So, um, so basically, for the first question, uh, the way I relate to the to the to King Farouk president is through family. Um, my family has been affected. By the time there was a lot of confiscation of land, and so my both my paternal and my maternal um, families were both affected by him. So I kind of grew up hearing stories of the past and of a time that I, I didn't really get to see, but I kind of just lived through the stories and through the time of the people that have, have lived it. So for me, kind of searching for a past in old Cairo was also a quest that I had be before even starting this project. But also I think seeing those political icons kind of amplified a historical lineage through my mind that had been there, but I never really kind of tried to dig in for. I always heard the stories, but I never actually started to look deeper below the layers. Um, I, some of those, some of the people that I've photographed, I had some conversations with while others, I didn't really have that much to talk with. So um, like it's, it really depended on the time and, and if people were really generous with me. Um, some of them didn't want to be photographed at first and then after an hour me sitting and just like going back and forth and, and just trying to talk to them, they would be photographed like this guy um, in the first photograph. Um, so yeah, I think there's a sort of personal connection between um, those parts and my uh, preconceived notions of those areas as well. So yeah. I hope this kind of, is there another question? Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, that's, that's wonderful to hear about your family, or not wonderful, but uh, difficult, I'm sure, to hear about your family's connections prior, prior to Nasser. Um, the, the, other, the other sort of aspect that I'm curious about is, um, and I'm assuming all of these were taken post-Arab Spring, or what we call Arab Spring here. I don't know what you might call it. Yeah, it's, take, it's all taken post-Arab Spring. And also I wasn't, during the revolution, I wasn't living in Cairo. 
I was studying abroad. And so I didn't really see the change. And so when I came back to Cairo in 2015, this is when I graduated and came back. This was when the time I was actually trying to gather all the stories that I had missed, trying to find places that had been affected by the revolution, kind of like rewriting the story of, of the revolution through my, my own experience, because I had only lived it through photographs, through Facebook posts, uh, just news from family, but I wasn't there. So I just, I always feel that I had missed a very important change that had happened. And so this, this kind of void also is, is I'm trying to, to fill it through such projects, I guess. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And so are you able to show these and get, I mean, I think about how, you know, countries change um, in all of the different ways that they do and leadership and that type of thing. And, and is, is, have you found an outlet for this um, within, within Egypt? So I showed this um, in, one of the, in, in one of the spaces here in Cairo, it's an NGO. Um, arts and culture space. Um, it's actually in, in old Cairo as well. So it was interesting because many people related to those, to those photographs. The people who are in the photographs weren't able to go, go and see their, their images. But, um, but a lot of people talked about this project being like something that it's, it resonates with each one of us differently. And because each president also each one of us, we have a, a certain narrative for him. So it's, it's very interesting to see the, the dichotomy between the past and present through, through our um, stories and also the stories of people who have lived it. So it, was, it, it wasn't really, um, there wasn't really a problem showing it, thank God. Um, and I think, um, I think it's interesting because there was, um, there was one portrait, but it's not shown in this edition, um, of, of uh, two um, um, married couple. One, the female is pro Nasser, like really pro Nasser, while the male is very indifferent about the situation, about all like politics anyways. So when I, when I was, and this portrait was taken in downtown Cairo, walking down the street, I saw Nasser's photo with El Sisi, which is the current president now, and so I think politically now people are so much kind of really uh, comparing Nasser with Sisi and, and saying that now we're kind of going back backwards a bit. Um, it's a very political sensitive topic, but I, I think I don't want to get into the politics of it. I think I, I just I'm interested in, in, in like the personal narratives that come along the way in terms of the I guess, cultural um, aspects of it. Hmm. Thank you. I, I thank everybody. Um, but uh, Amina, I think that what you've done, I mean, for me, it, it makes me think about bringing people together. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, I'd really like to thank everybody for being here today and particularly the photographers and Legetho. Uh, I think it's been an extraordinary afternoon. Um, what I'd like to do is something a little bit radical for Zoom is that I'm going to unmute everybody and I'd like everybody to applaud the photographers and it may create a little bit of havoc, but let's see. see. And I'll, well, the whole thing about special thanks to is on the screen and then start fading it, but play with it a little bit and see what you think. I like that idea. Uh, I, I just don't want to make... Um, <laughs> Congratulations, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Beautiful chaos. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It was amazing. I, uh, I like the scroll and would prefer to have that. If we can't make it look right, then maybe the best thing is okay, to make all the credits as single slides, but let's try with the